You're listening to the Mobcast Network. Yo, Joe! He'll fight for freedom wherever there's trouble. G.I. Joe is there. G.I. Joe! G.I. Joe is there. It's G.I. Joe against Cobra the Enemy, fighting to save the day. He never gives up. He's always there, fighting for freedom over land and air. G.I. Joe! Those of you who don't know already, I'm about to present um, author, uh, artist, uh, and all around amazing guy as well as a veteran, Mr. Larry Hallam. Yeah. Also, uh, amazing voice actor who's voiced everything from Plastic Man to Parquet Butter. Please sit up and ring the bell. <laughs> and of course, another fine actor who's a boy, cartoon voice of Rambo, but you also remember him also as Shipwreck, Dusty, Heavy Metal, Buzzer, to Thinker. Uh, Thunder and Monkey Wrench, Mr. Uh, Neil Ross. Neil Ross. <laughs> and of course, of course, Mr. Bell here, of course, we all know as Duke, but you may not know, also is the voice of Zamot, Major of Blood, Scrap Iron, and Lift Ticket Clutch, one of my favorite, one of my favorite original characters, and Toll Booth, one of my favorite action figures. <laughs> <laughs> so that was you. Yes, that was me. <laughs> well, actually, curious, the, the, the toll booth toy and the whole toy was actually was a Sears exclusive and actually considered a very rare, very rare. Because it was only one made. Exactly. Yes. And I was the one weird kid that got it, you know? Well I used I also used to dub the bad guy voices in Sunny Chiba movies. Did you? Yeah. What? <laughs> well, Tell them about your adult. Mr. Chiba. I'll kill you now. <laughs> Yeah, they, don't, they don't put the stuff that we get that we don't want to do. Voice office for adult films. <laughs> all those, all those looping in the basements. <laughs> Tighter circles. Ah, uh, no, it's oh. <laughs> well, let me ask this. Let me ask. Sorry, video, Larry. Uh, uh, for those of you who may not know the story, go ahead. Uh, how 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 did GI Joe uh, begin? For you? Well, Hasbro came to Marvel uh, and wanted to do a, a comic of uh, G.I. Joe. And because uh, they, they were bringing it back as a three, three quarter inch, and G.I. Joe had been pro inch figures. So they figured, oh, well, let's do a comic. And uh, at that time, uh, comics were the bottom of the barrel for, as far as the, the creators. And everybody told me, if you do a, a, a toy a toy book, I would get offered an A-list book uh, from any of the companies ever again. And there was a difference? What? There was a difference? Well, the pay was much less because the licensing fee came right off the top of the page rate. So, so what was in the book? I don't understand because I read comic books. What was in the book that they, they wanted you to do? At that time, you know, like X Men, right. uh, Spider Man, Fantastic Four, Spider Man. Oh, you know, these okay. were A list books. I got it. It's generally uh, superheroes that started in comics as opposed to an external property right. that would be licensed out. Uh, but the licensed properties were also, you know, they were basically publicity deals for whatever you know, the product was. Okay. okay, so it would be toys or a, a TV show or okay. even like a. a, a Marvel did something like four movie adaptations a year. And, uh, and then we have these editorial meetings that because we, we, we offered like 30 movies adaptations. So you had to like look at these, all they said were well, scripts. <laughs> and maybe, you know, a couple of headshots of like. Guys, are there any prototypes that you got with the headshots of the actors? And I remember one year we we had to choose between uh, Meteor and uh, some something called Indiana Jones about some <laughs> yeah. archaeologist. Uh, okay. <coughs> right. And they said, "Oh, and, and he fights Nazis." You know, Who cares? <laughs> 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 We've got Sean Connery fighting a meteor right now. That's something. Well, the, the meteor people said does this incredible. Still, of this uh, 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 aerial shot of Manhattan Island with a giant smoky crater in the middle of it. You know? And they said, hey, it's got <coughs> Sean Connery and Natalie Wood and, sure. you know, all these people in it. 
Well, we were, we were having sort of a similar discussion in the car, and I was going to say the greatest line I've ever read about this business was written by William Goldman in a book called Adventures in a Screen Trade. <laughs> he said, let me explain something about Hollywood. Rule one, nobody knows anything. <laughs> right. And it's true. I mean, the stories of... I, I had a buddy who was fooling around on the Paramount lot, and he described going into a building, and the whole thing was devoted to this super huge big budget movie they were going to put out called Krakatoa East of Java. <laughs> and he said, way down at the end of the hall in one dingy little office with a cardboard sign in the window that said, The Godfather. Yeah. Right. But no, Krakatoa East of Java. It turned out Krakatoa is actually west of Java. West they didn't yeah. find that out until it was And finished. that's where the actors who were in it are, are now. now. Yes. Right. <laughs> well, obviously you've never heard of Krakatoa, and you have heard of The Godfather, but that was the thinking at the time. Give, give this clown a cardboard sign in the local office. He's going nowhere with this stupid gangster movie. We're doing Krakatoa East of Java. <laughs> so nobody knows anything. Who was it that said, I think it was early, it's like the 30s, uh, wrote to a friend in New York and said, like, Get, get your ass out here in Hollywood. There's a fortune to be made, and the competition are idiots. <laughs> uh, was, that, was that Sid Perlman? No. I think it was Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> no, 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 Broadway, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they all got lured out to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> they all went, became alcoholics, right? You know. Yeah, something like that. So, uh, yeah. So go ahead. So, uh, DI Joe was this considered this sort of secondary thing that nobody wanted. And you, well, you nobody, told me, I mean, they they asked every single Marvel writer for contract and non contract, and they all every single one turned it down. So then they, had, they came to the office and went down all the editorial row and asked every editor and every assistant editor and every uh, intern and every kid that they sent out to get coffee. And even the, co the coffee kid wouldn't do it. <laughs> they, they find, my office was literally but physically the last one. And, uh, and they got me and I said, <laughs> and you were, you were editing at the time. I was a full editor. Full editor, but you wanted to get into the writing side uh, of it. Th nobody would give me any writing work. It was, I, I'd been drawing comics for uh, 15 years. And uh, all the editors were writers. And the last <coughs> thing they wanted to see was an artist who was writing his own stuff. Yes. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> this was before, yeah, right. before Byrne and Miller had really like right, uh, hit, right. hit, yeah. changed the paradigm of that. And uh, so they, uh, I, I took, I, I figured, oh, if I get a year out of this, um, this will be good, you know, because that's how long the license book was expected to last. Yeah. In fact, yeah. until GI Joe happened, uh, common knowledge in the toy industry was that a toy lasted three years max and if you didn't bail out at the third year and you got you know, over optimistic you'd be stuck with warehouses full of cabbage patch dolls um, which is what happened yeah, you know. yeah. and be and be what is it beanie, beanie babies, babies. Yeah. yeah well it was the same thing with animation you know, the target audience was, I don't know, what, 12 to 14. And the thought, in three years, they age out. They're not teenagers. They're not interested in animation anymore. They never will be again. No adult will be interested in animation. <laughs> and so a, a new crop of kids is coming. They're not going to want to watch their older brothers. Stuff. They're going to want new stuff. Now, Michael was in the Smurfs, and that, they lasted seven years. And that was an astonishing run yeah, for yeah, that yeah. time period. But the idea that you could do a show like uh, The Simpsons and have it run, what is it now, 26 years? 20 years, uh, yeah. Since 89. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it would have been literally unthinkable, right? <coughs> At nighttime, oh, yeah. nighttime animation? <coughs> what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah they'd, have, they'd have put you in a straitjacket. <laughs> well, I, would, I, would, I always say, like, I have a comedy act. I say, like, silly things I do in the time machine. I'm like, oh, I'll go back to the mid-80s, and I'll tell everybody, My Little Pony's biggest fans in the future are going to be grown adult men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, you know, I remember when we got to year three at G.I. Joe, you know, Hasbro said, okay, well, time to 
fold up the tents and go away. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, but the thing is, it had been selling so well all, yeah. all across the board. The, the, the toys were pretty good, the TV show was getting good, good numbers, uh, and the comic was like number one. <coughs> and, 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 and it was so. the first comic book, and I think the last comic book that ever had actual commercials. Animated commercials, right. you know, for issue one and alternate ones. We did, didn't we do commercials? Mm -hmm. We did some of those commercials as characters saying, kids, well, make those, sure you don't cross the street without your parents. Well, those were the, oh, those the PSAs. PSA. 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 Yeah, yeah, they did. There, weren't, there wasn't voice of work. I think when they did the series, I think that laid the ground for the series, and that's what I want to say. That's where you came on in. Yeah, the, uh, they actually created four commercials before the first comic book was done. Yeah. I had to, to, uh, Design the covers yeah. because they, you know, the covers like spun out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so oh, horrible had, comics! Yeah. yeah. So I, I created the covers for four books that I hadn't even didn't even ever thought about what the heck was going to be in them. So when I got to those issues, I had to look at the covers and go, "Okay, now I, I box myself into a hole like I'm, like, you know, uh, a ski trooper and a." And a you know, and hang lighter, yeah. Hang, hang for, lighter. It's yeah. all in the same, same shot. But uh, and you had to write around Hasbro's. Okay, here's the new characters. So yeah. work them in. But who, you know, who knew? We had no nobody yeah. connected with it. Thought that it was going to, you know, have any sort of uh, so life because it, <coughs> they, uh, it had never happened before. Yeah. So you were in New York, uh, you were doing that, doing the file cards. Meanwhile, out in sunny Cali, uh, Mike, this is where you come on into it. How did the, the series come up on your radar at first? Uh, just like Neil got a call to go out and pay for this thing. Yeah. And they had all these prototypes. And I thought we drew them only hundreds of prototypes out there. And he said, pick three characters and pick a character. <laughs> really? Said, they let you pick the character? Oh, yeah, at that point. He said, you know, pick the ones you think are close to you or whatever. So wow. I picked three of the women and, and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said, the guy will always be Scarlet in my heart. Yeah, yeah. be Scarlet. <laughs> did, did Mary Mack come in? <laughs> what? Did Mary Mack come in? Mary came in and, right. and uh, BJ. I don't know how, how many of them. And so we read them. And uh, I said, yeah, well, I said, that's great. Uh, whomever, whoever approved it, we have no idea who approved it about it. And then as we went along, <coughs> and new characters were introduced, uh, Wally would just say, you're going to do this character. And we had to come up with something that was different from the other three characters, right. or two characters. And they were allowed, according to screen actors, we were allowed to give um, three characters and get paid for one. And so if you had an extra character, you wouldn't always have three characters. You always you know, may have three characters in the show, but you never have four. So they take one character out, so you only wind up doing three. So that's, that's per episode? Per episode, yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah. That's, wow. So that's a messed up rule. <coughs> room full of actors. <coughs> right. Room full of actors. Right. I mean, we were just packed in here. It was. Uh, very odd. <laughs> <laughs> that was something too. You guys did a lot of actual joint sessions. Uh, I, 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 was, I sat with some of your contemporaries. Yeah, and everybody in the, in the room together. Uh, well, we all knew. You know, we were doing either in humanoids in the GI Joe and the Transformers. It was. Uh, it was. Uh, we did everything but sleep together. I mean, we were, <laughs> I'm not speaking for myself. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, we used to record that there were two studios: Wally Burr North and Wally Burr South. I had a big war. Anyway, Wally Burr South was quite nice, large room, a nice area. It was just beautiful. We, we never worked there. We were always in Wally Burr North, which was this cramped little room. And Wally would brew up this big bowl of popcorn, which did nothing for me. I'm one of the three people in America that could test popcorn, but everybody else seemed to appreciate it. And, oh, I don't know, about a year into the mission, uh, the room began to smell like stale popcorn and middle-aged actors. <laughs> It's a strange aroma. <coughs> Which is worse. <laughs> never, you'll never forget it. If they had, if they had, if they had taped the comments oh. that we had, as opposed to the show, right. it would have been absolutely, probably one of those shows called Forbidden. Right. Yeah. Because we, we were, because some of the people were stand up that were doing voiceover, so we had a lot of competition in terms of jokes and playing and talking and so. And then working on voices, 
intermittently. I mean, th this was a pulpit. It was like a huge ministrone of voices, is what it was. And it was great. But they didn't do that. But now we record, when we record, we record as, as by ourselves, solitary, because everybody else made me busy. And so you don't work with other people. So, <laughs> so you. You booked the first, you were on the first mini series, the first uh, five part. Yes, yeah, so I yeah. don't. <laughs> that's okay, I'm good at birth really reason, where I but, this, but the second mini series, though, that's where uh, Neil, you came on in, I believe, because mm -hmm. that's when so where Shipwreck made his debut. Well, I, the first character I, I got was uh, Buzzer, who was one of the dreadnoughts. Okay. Oh, you were Buzzer. Yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was still in the the, the second miniseries. So the Dreadnoughts debut because they busted yeah, Corey. Guess who told I, you? I, didn't I, yeah. <laughs> you know, no, I was just saying. Is a little bit of trivia. The guy I based Buzzer on is is now the, uh, the head or uh, uh, artistic director at SpongeBob. <laughs> yeah, he's been at, he's he's been at SpongeBob oh, since, right, since the beginning. He's the, nice. He's the big cheese now at SpongeBob. <laughs> So was it the same for you? They brought you in to read. They, did they? Well, I had been characters? working on and off for Wally Burr. I assume everybody knows who Wally Burr is. No, yes. Maybe. Go ahead, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead and tell him. He was the voice director on both uh, GI Joe and Transformers and a number of other shows. And I started working for him when he was doing Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, which was a series in the late 70s, early 80s. And so at a certain point, Wally called my agent and said, have you come in and read for this uh, character because it's a cockney and I know we can do that. And that was the start. I had no idea what the hell this show was about. I, I, you, know, you, you had the same experience. You just suddenly thrown in and... Uh, I, I wasn't watching. Uh, I wasn't watching animation at all, unless it was porno. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, a, a little later on, Shipwreck came along, and that, of course, was a huge break for me because that's probably maybe the most one of the most uh, popular characters I ever got to do. Yeah, <clears throat> and that was the second one. And then, who did Polly? And that, you know, sometimes I did, sometimes Frank Welker did. Really? Like, uh, yeah. Your, your bird? Yeah. yeah. Was, that, <laughs> was that one of the three characters? <laughs> that, that count as a character? Yes, it would. Yes, really? It would. Oh, yes, wow. it would. They got you. They got you coming. Wow. If Polly sneezed, that was a character. <laughs> That's funny. So then after that second mini series, then you guys were booking the regular series leading up to, uh, I want to go a little bit about the, the G.I. Joe movie, because it's, sure. that's interesting because Duke, mortally wounded, originally yeah. planned, supposed to be killed, yeah. but they learned their lesson quickly from the Transformers movie when they killed off Optimus Prime, that, oh, this it's was Prowl. not, and, Pr and Prowl, wow. and Jazz, and Wheeljack, and all those first generations. For the express purpose, as I understand the mythology was, Oh, we want to kill up all those characters so that the kids will have more of an impetus to buy the new ones we're going to follow sure. on them. Now, that was it. Uh, uh, Buzz, no, not Buzz Dix. Yeah, Flynn, Flynn Dilly was, was talking about it and an appearance we made in, in L.A. And he said, yeah, that was the plan. They came to him and they said, all right, we're going to kill all these characters. Really? Yeah. And then, yeah. All the new ones are coming in. But by the time the G.I. Joe movie, which never actually became a movie, started production, uh, Transformers had bombed so badly that they said, uh, well, we need to rethink this. And it, it never was a movie. They turned it into a miniseries. And Duke didn't die. I said, kill my brother. <laughs> Duke, Duke he's is still just, actor on, he's on camera. Duke, is, Duke is, is in a coma. I know. And he will regain consciousness if his doll starts selling it's again. My doll. Yes. No, 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 action figure. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I remember when it was a Mac male action figure. I mean, was it very Mac, very Mac, or B J Kim? And she said, "I'm not in much of these shows." I said, "I said the time, but your doll isn't selling." <laughs> <laughs> I no, no idea what I was talking about. The producer said that to her. I yeah. thought that was the deal. And she went, "Is he joking?" And we said, "We don't know." And that started the the well, line. If you're see, not that, is, if that was the, that was the problem they had at the very beginning. Was that you know they only had this one female character. In they had Scarlet. That was, that was, mm -hmm. yeah. And they didn't even want to do her because they said, well, no 10 year old boy is going to buy a female action figure because that's no longer an action figure. <coughs> if it's, it's a female, doll. it's a doll. Right. Mm -hmm. And no 10 year old boy is going to put down his own money to buy a doll. And I said, 
but that's silly, you know. I mean, you know, you gotta have, you know, some uh, some female characters mm -hmm. like that. And so I I just made up one to go in the first issue because all these uh, Cobra characters didn't have faces. And I said, well, you gotta have agents of expression in order to tell mm -hmm. a visual story. You have to have people reacting. So I said, okay, let's make her a female and let's make it, you know, a hot babe in a, in a black, complete black leather outfit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we came up with Baroness. And as soon as the Hasbro people saw her on the page, they went, I'm sure, of course. Let's, and let's I don't do a toy. <laughs> and that toy was <clears throat> sold hot, like hot cake. Which man, shipwreck. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and, and curious enough, and certainly in the comics, I don't think never I don't think got enough credit for really fleshing out the female characters. I mean, Scarlet was not a damsel in distress. I mean, she was right there, toe to toe in the missions. And Baroness was almost the most uh, sympathetic uh, of all the Cobra hierarchy. You know, she was always kind of caught in the middle. So. Well, that's nothing like the on-camera film, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hey, they gave him a cameo. <laughs> yes, they did. They gave him a cameo. Oh, we'll lose it with that. So, who's um, he going to play? The, what's his name? Oh, uh, Magic Mike? No, no, yeah. <laughs> Magic Mike. What's his name? Channing Tatum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. My, my girls and I just was friends with the girl that he was growing with, and the, the young girl. And in the course of it, he talked about the fact that he was doing G.I. Joe. They were like, oh, my dad did the voice in the uh, animated series. He went, ah. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. When you hear him interviewed, I always loved the show. And it was one of my oh, favorite wow. shows. And why I'm so thrilled to play Duke, because I love that character. He could dare. It's really well, funny. That's, that's it's called fun. acting. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, <laughs> Maybe one of you guys does. Well, you know, they, they hired me to be the, uh, the, uh, the consultant for the first movie. And uh, they, they sent me uh, the first draft of the script. Oh, God. And <laughs> they had this big scene at the end where Snake Eyes talks. Oh, you know, really? So <laughs> I put the back and I said, you know, there's something. I, you know, Snake Eyes can't talk, and uh, 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 it's, uh, Lorenzo de Bonaventura said, oh yeah, that's, isn't that great? <laughs> Here you got this character who the entire movie can't, doesn't say a word, and in the last scene, he talks, and I said, but he can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> And that's when I realized that they were paying me this money to be a consultant. And like, I had to prioritize it. And, and I said, all this other stuff that I thought was yeah. wrong, I could live with. But if every day I just consistently said 10 times a day, you can't fucking talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and finally, they actually shot the scene. Oh, really? You know, where, where he talks. That, that's how far they got. But at the last minute, they said, okay. Cooler heads prevail. They should have had a girl dub his voice. What? Yeah. They should have had a girl dub oh, his right. voice. That would have brought in a lot of people. Like, like, like an eight-year-old girl or something. I was to say, it's like, a, I'd like to supersize, please. I mean, <laughs> uh, so are trying to do a thing. Well, speaking of voices, though, uh, in the in the GI Joe context, uh, was was there a character that you see the script? Oh, okay, these are the ones that are easy for me. Was there ever one that was just maybe harder to do than the other ones? No, no, no. Oh, I don't know. They they threw another character at me called Monkey Wrench, and they said we want them. Uh, I have an English background. Uh, I was just born over there, and then they whisked me off to Canada. But I uh, I was raised by an English mother, so I can do a lot of that stuff. And, uh, they said we need an authentic Welsh accent. I said, oh yeah, of course. You know, YouTube wasn't around. Uh, you know, I'm kind of in trouble. So all I did was pitch you really loud. I went down here, you know, and I said, "Accent." That's it. Well, we we did spiral zone too. We did spiral yeah. zone. 
Mm. And, and uh, they wanted me to do an Australian accent. He went up there. I, I, there was no way. Cause I, we didn't have, as he said, we couldn't Google that sound. And I wasn't yeah. seeing any Australian film. Now mm. I can do that. But then you, you were stuck. You know, they threw some at you. You're a Maori. I'm not a Maori. There's no way I'm a Maori. You have no idea what that sounds like. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, there were, there, I don't think there was anything that I would admit to that was difficult. I think it was all uh, off the cuff. All um, if I if I couldn't do it, I I would have to say I you know, don't do that. Ne never admit yeah. that you can't do something. I did. Oh no no no! I agree. There, with that. There, there was just, a couple. Of if really there was a character like oh god this one. All right. Well, well, yeah, take off the, the job and yeah. see right now as you go. I had, I had done um, uh, uh, a series for Hannibal uh, Buress where I had a thunder where I had a very really gravel. Which character? Um, I don't recall. Oh, it's like thunder! I oh, love that. Ookla? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was that. <laughs> you know, it was a ookla that chewed by. It might have been. So. It was just. <laughs> and the same thing in humanoids. I had a, I had to be a giant glob of mucus. <laughs> and they were the world. <laughs> this is this is for music next. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> I'm all like, like that, and it killed me. It kills my voice. So when I would get something and it was too deep, and you know, Wally would say. You know, a little deeper, Mike. I go get get Susan Silo. She's got a much deeper voice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I can't do that. Well, that's you know. Uh, I remember I, uh, I went to the interview for a, a voiceover job uh, for a PBS documentary, and they said, "Well, can you do a Japanese accent?" <laughs> you know, yeah. and I, I said, "Well, what region?" Oh, you could do a different region. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's you know, I just. You know, just made it, you know, like, I'm third generation Japanese American. You know, my mom grew up, in, you know, was born and grew up in Sacramento, California. She actually said things like, G. Willigers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, did you, so did you watch Mickey Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, so, you know, I just, I, I faked it completely in the, uh, you know, I got the job over, like, Five other guys who actually had real Japanese accents. <laughs> but they kept calling me back. You know, so the, two, the two actors who I think had the, the toughest time vocally, uh, the G.I. Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, would, would have been Arthur Burkhart and Chris Latta. Yeah. There was a lot of screaming, but then both of them were, were able to do that. They know? sounded like that anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When's lunch? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, in the green room, they I've were sat with Arthur, uh, yeah, louder right. and more and more effusive than when they were playing those characters. So. You don't I'm just just do this endlessly. Oh, endlessly. endlessly. Who did Burkhart? I'm sorry? Uh, Destro. 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 Arthur Burkhart. Oh, Arthur. Arthur. Yeah, okay. Arthur. And, and Arthur, Arthur's laugh can strip you with clothes. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to be in a men's room and in the next stall. <laughs> So he says, well, you know, as yes, as yes, you know, know yes, 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 I actually don't know who voices. I'm an actor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but he, yeah, he's a, he's an absolute trip. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, just a comment. I met uh, Dick Goodyear a long time ago. Dick Goodyear. Yes. Oh yes, and you know, you know, rest in peace. And uh, he said uh, when he got the the part of Serpentor, he was happy. But then as time went on, his voice started to uh, go because he was screaming all the time. Yeah. 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 So. Dick uh, came from Broadway, too. He was uh, the original Bye Bye Birdie. He was Birdie. Oh, wow. Yeah. Broadway, yeah. In so, uh, Jaime the Robot. And he was mm -hmm. Jaime the Robot yes. also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He had a, he's gone. Yeah. But uh, he was really super. And he, great record to our jokes. Mm -hmm. Just, just constant. <laughs> and and <laughs> exacerbating the problem with Wally wanted to a lot of tanks. Yeah, at that point, that's why we all went on strike because we, we oh, yeah, yeah. just got over that. you know eight hours of, of screaming and yelling, and it, it's not terrible. You know, acting is great fun, but after a while, it beats you down. If you're doing the same thing over and over, you can't come up with anything new. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, if, if you don't get it the first or second time, then then you're not going to. That's my feeling. You, you got it the first time. You want a little bit of a difference, you can give it a different take or whatever it is. Sure. Eight times, nine times, or whatever. We've got a lot of people in that room. I mean, after a while, I threw a mushroom on my chest, it was so hot in there. Huh. Mm -hmm. Can we do one more take, Orson? I think we have a dunk. Yes, exactly. <laughs>
That's what I used to love about uh, the late uh, Gordon Hunt, rest his soul. He was the guy who did most of the directing at Anna Barbera when Michael and I were working there. If, if he didn't get it in two takes, he would just move. He'd say, okay, moving on. And then he would come to you after the whole thing was over and everybody was signing their paperwork. Would you mind waiting a minute? I want to talk to you. Oh, yeah. That was after that. And then he'd say, could we try that line one more time? I'm Absolutely. sure we'll get it. Absolutely. And, of course, all the pressure's off. You're relaxed. You're fine. You nail it like that. But yeah. Wally would just, oh, it's over. And the takes would climb into the teens and 20s. Uh, and I said this at a, a convention. He was sitting right next to me. He said, I don't remember that. I said, well, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I love you. Uh, you're, you made my career, but God damn it. Yes. <laughs> Up into the 20s. Well, I said that when he was doing, uh, when we were doing the, the movie, uh, Transformers, um, I wanted to see him direct Orson Welles because I would love to be in the room. And he said, no, you, you can't be in the room. And, and he directed him. And I was at one point, he gave Orson Welles a line read. <laughs> and uh, Orson Welles said, Wally, you're giving me a line. And he said, no, 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 actually. And Orson Welles didn't, didn't live much longer after that. I yeah. said, Wally killed Orson Welles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that spread the rumor. And he questioned me on that. Not, not too terribly wrong. You know. I said, did you tell me? I said, yes, I did. <laughs> You killed most of us. I know you did because you almost killed us. <laughs> we had a thing we wanted oh, to do. Out of you and you go. That's right. We had a thing we wanted to do, and the technology didn't exist then. Now, with all this computer stuff, some kid in Philadelphia could have done it for us. But there's a scene in, in Orson Welles' uh, classic movie, Citizen Kane, near the beginning of the movie, where old Kane <coughs> is dying, and they focus on his lips, and he says, Rose, but I dies. We were going to overdub it. Maurice LaMarche could do a great Orson Welles and have him say, Wally Bird. <laughs> and invite Wally to a party, get him drunk, and then. <laughs> so, oh, I wish they'd done it. Well, you know, oh, my God. It cost us a thousand bucks back then. Said, worth oh, it, worth oh, it. Yeah, so funny. Sure. Here's a, here's a, a D.I. G.I. Joe deep dive, uh, since I both got you here. Okay. At the beginning of your run, Hawk was the leader. And then when the cartoon came out, all of a sudden there's this character, Duke. And I was like, who the hell is this Duke? And where is Hawk? How, do you remember, I, like, did Hasbro like, change their minds with the cartoon side of it, or? Hawk's doll wasn't selling. <laughs> it, didn't, it, it didn't even come on out. Hawk didn't come until way later in the cartoon, but he was the, the, the de facto leader of the team. And in the cartoon, or the, the comic, you introduced Duke at a much later date in the early 20s. Well, uh, that was because I said, you know, how realistic is, is it to have this general meaning? I, mean, uh, I always approached it from the enlisted man's point of view. Sure. And I said, look, you know, it's like, uh, there's an old army saying that, like, you know, the, the, the captain is, is supposed to be in charge of the company, but the company belongs to the first sergeant. Right. You know? I can testify to that. Uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> so uh, I said, look, you know, we should really have, you know, who's the first shirt? And yeah. Stuff. So they, they didn't have one. So that's how, you know, we, we, we brought Duke in. And, you know, the problem was always that a lot of people couldn't tell the difference between Duke and, and Ed Hawk. Yeah. They were like, you know, a six foot white guy with blonde hair. Yeah, <laughs> they all look like, 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 like Steve Rogers, you know? Right. Uh, so, um, that, that's when Hawk started to like step back yeah. in, in, into the background, you know? Um, and uh, I, I just tried to develop Duke as, as a more approachable character. Sure. And, uh, that's how it goes. This gentleman, thanks you for that. Yes, absolutely. And I got to play. In one of the last things we did locally, Jason Marsden was the young Duke, and I wound up playing his father, who was married to B.J. Ward, who was uh, Scarlet. Wow. So we played husband and wife to Jason, and it was to Jason Marsden, who was the young Duke. It was in a new series, a G.I. Joe series. Yeah. And it was so good. It was so well written, so well done. Worth getting canceled. Yes, <laughs> of course. It was that, uh, that Hasbro wisdom. network yeah. uh, thing that was wisdom. Let's cancel yeah. that. And it was really good. It was really it good. Was it was solid. It was a smart show. It was solid. Neil, uh, for shipwreck, um, did they did they just did, what, what was the what was that what was the impetus behind the, the character of choice on the voice? 
Oh, yeah, well, that, uh, I showed up, and they had a picture of a sailor, and uh, I did a couple of takes, and I could tell nobody was particularly thrilled, and I couldn't come up with anything else. And I was ready to say thanks a lot and goodbye. And there was a guy sitting in the corner. I, never, I, I don't know who the hell he was. I never saw him again. But he looked at me and he said, did you ever see the last detail? <laughs> and fortunately, I had. I don't know if you're familiar with the movie or not. It's a movie Jack Nicholson made. He was nominated for an Oscar for Best Actor. He didn't win that year. And then the following years, he had Cuckoo's Nest and Chinatown. And everybody forgot about the last detail. But it's a marvelous movie. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. There's a bar scene in there that, to me, is probably the genesis of the shipwreck character. <clears throat> and I had been doing a voice for a long time. It was kind of my all-purpose stoner voice, you know, a guy that's had a few uh, joints and, uh, and hung up and then no one. Anyway, uh, people would sort of comment. That sort of sounds Jack Nicholson-ish. So I thought, what if I take away the, the weed and put him, put, put a couple of pots of coffee in him and make him just a little bit uh, hyper? We'll try that. And I did the audition in that voice, and the guy in the corner said, you got it, which is usually the kiss of death. The minute they tell you, you got it, uh, you might as well pack your bags and go home because you're not going to get it. But in, in this instance, I did get it, and uh, it turned into a wonderful character. That literally just happened to me two weeks ago. <laughs> Reading, that's great. Stick around. And I was like, yeah, okay, it is. Was, okay, we want to see. We're just around Tom, Dick, and Mary. Everybody else thinks you're Like, why am I sitting here for you? Mm -hmm. that, that's acting. I finally got to the point in my career after years of working, thankfully, that when I read for something and, and, and the whole room laughed, and everyone was laughing on the floor, laughing and said, oh my God, that was so great. He did this and did that. And I turned around and I said, I said, ah, another one I didn't get. <laughs> and they all looked at me and said, see you guys. And no, I didn't get it. I knew of it because they just loved it. I knew they had already calls out to somebody else. Yeah. Point. So it's like, that's, yeah. that's auditioning. For those of you that don't experience that. <coughs> so uh, uh, has anybody got any questions for these guys? <laughs> I'd say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. Uh, now you know, knowing half the battle, the PSAs. How did that come about, and whose idea was that? <laughs> well, uh, Flint Dilly went through that. But maybe yeah, you know Flint. Yeah. Maybe you know the story better than than, than he did. Or, uh, was that, was that kind of a requirement? To well, no. Essentially, they were they were getting a lot of flack over this military show for kids. You know, this is not good. Uh, you know, the cultural zeitgeist changes, and, and now there's a lot of respect and love for the military. But back then, it was we were still coming off of Vietnam, and it was like oh, I'm teaching kids to kill. This is not good. So they originally started doing the PSAs as a way to sort of soften the blow. No, we're not. See, we're doing this good thing uh, in addition to all this other stuff. And, and it was literally just sort of an ass covering thing. At least that's according to Flint. But you would be amazed at the number of people, and I'm sure you get this more than I do, who come up and say, you know, this show changed my life. And they start talking about how they were raised in a horrible situation and they were ostracized in school, and all they had was this show. And they wanted to live their lives based on what they saw in the show and these PSAs. And then they go on to say, yeah, I had 10 years in the military, and now I'm in law enforcement, here are my kids. You still get that. <laughs> it changed my life. I mean, still get that. Still get that. In fact, I said to one guy, he said, this is my buddy, and this is my buddy, and we were in the service, and we all each other because of Duke. And I said, you, you didn't kill anybody and yell my name, did you? <laughs> <laughs> and straight up, no, 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 sir. And uh, we're cops now. And I said, great, that's... Can I have your card so I can call you in case I get in trouble? <laughs> I get a ticket? Yeah, sure. Hey, Fix it. You got fan mail too from the same type of guys on the comic side, right? I, I, I get a lot of people coming up and say that uh, they, you know, they, they just retired 20 years in the military mm -hmm. and you know, all these movies have been drawn. And, uh, uh, I, I tell them, look, you know, that's wasn't what I set out to do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the last issue I did for the oh, war, oh, uh, you know, I, I pretty much said, look, you know, you're not going to get a parade, you know, you're not going to ever get a lot of respect from you know, most of America. Uh, 
know, there, there's reasons for, do, for doing this and there's reasons not to do it. And, uh, but, you know, it's, and the snake eyes speaking. You know, it's, it's like a, a letter from snake eyes. And he, and he's talking to this kid who wants to join him. He says, yeah, but, you know, then it's three pages of like, you know, the horror stuff. And it's like green, too. Is that what you think of the sound? How is that? That was like getting the shuttle out of the hotel on the day. Yeah, there's, there's three solid pages of Snake Eyes saying. I remember the issue. Of saying things like, you know, the, uh, recounting the time he was in, in the hospital next to this guy who had like burns over 90% of his body. All night long, with like you know, begging snake eyes to like you know, smother him with a pillow, you know, uh, coming off a, 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 an airplane and being spat on. Uh, they were all things that I, you know that I personally experienced, you know, and um, and then snake eyes says, well, but at the same time. Know that, uh, and again, he's writing this. <laughs> yeah, that that you'll you'll never ever for the rest of your life meet people that uh, are that loyal to you personally, and that uh, that closeness and that camaraderie you know, will not exist. Mm -hmm. And when you go out into the workforce, you know that feeling of personal responsibility is not there. You know, uh, in, in the Army, uh, the chain of command runs both ways. You know, that if you're an E3, uh, an E3 you're a PFC or E4, Spec 4, is this and, you know, and you're responsible for the E1s and the E2s when they report to you. Yeah. And uh, you don't sleep until they sleep. You don't eat until they eat. <coughs> and you're personally responsible. And um, they don't teach that in the MBA program. It's a part of the MBA. Um, and uh, I said, yeah, that's, you know, had, I, I felt responsible. I had to lay, lay it out. Say, well, well, this is the, these, this is the downside, and this is, you know, the plus side. You know, the plus side isn't all that material. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm always amazed when I read that ex-service people are having trouble finding employment. If I was running a business, boy, an ex-service person came in, they would go right to the top of the list because I would know that this is somebody that. Just in all probability, you know, far more responsible. I, I was just, uh, before I came out here, got a call. Uh, there's a guy, three tours of Vietnam, living on the street with his dog. So uh, a group of us got together and we raised funds to get him into a Motel 6. It's freezing now, 30 degrees, 40 degrees. And I called him. And so we got him to Motel 6. I went to meet him and the dog. And boy, he's military. You know he's military. I mean, right down to the buzz cut. I mean, somewhere I think he's sixty something years old now. And uh, you have to be. Yeah, yeah, he's like close to seventy. Close to seventy. Yeah, <laughs> and he's living in the street. And I, and, and I would confront it. People would say, I don't understand. I understand we have homeless, but this is a guy who had three tours of Vietnam. He will not relinquish his dog to go into one of those cock out places that they put on this game if they don't take the dog to pride. That is crazy to me. You know, I, I, I said to him, because I put it on my credit card, I said, look, do me a favor. Don't screw up the room, because I know you're enjoying it. Yeah, I really got a dog. You don't smoke in the room. I said, take it. You know, I was a grunt. Just listen to the grunt for once. <laughs> right. I know you're enjoying it. I know you, I know you got a hard head on this. He said, don't you worry about it, boy. Don't you worry about it, fine. <laughs> and I said, good. And he has, and he was. But, you know, how about you doing Well, you know, the, 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 the U.S. government has never been very, uh, you know, uh, to, to veterans. I mean, you know, they, they after World War II, veterans got taken care of. Yes. The GI Bill yes. and all yes. this stuff. But, you know, you forget that. 
you know, after World War I, there was this thing called the Bonus March, where all the, the World War I veterans had been promised a bonus, and uh, the U.S. Uh, reneged on it. It was the middle of the Depression, and they had this march on, on Washington to demand their, their bonus, and uh, the Fed sicked the, the National Guard on them, and they fired on them, and uh, killed a whole bunch of them, burned down their, their tent city. <coughs> And uh, Douglas MacArthur was in charge of the unit that they fired on. Uh, after, you know, you ever heard of the Rough Riders, Teddy Roosevelt? Oh, yeah. No, they came back from Cuba with malaria, and uh, the government didn't want to take care of them, so they sent them out to Montauk Point, at the end of Long Island. There was nothing there yeah. but the you know, rocks and surf. And they set up a, a tent city out there, and 50% of them died in the first winter. <laughs> more people, when more people mourn the death of the death of Prowl from the Transformers. More people would mourn the death of a character, GI Joe, yeah. than they would the, the real. That's a, the, the strength of the animation, the strength yeah. of comic books is so powerful. I, I, I think it's, it's harder for them to get away with stuff like that with the internet. Yeah. Oh, they can't do it anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no. What, uh, point break, uh, is there anything uh, come up on the horizon uh, you, like, you, you can share with us? Any projects, any series, any work, anything cool? Or... Uh, we're, we're old. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the other problem is uh, they're really getting uh, uh, paranoid about the theft of intellectual property. So a lot of the time when we audition or work for some project, we have to sign this non-disclosure agreement. Sure. Spill the beans, they take our firstborn child and, and, and everything else. So I, I'm reticent, but I have written a book. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. It is, it is called Vocal Recall A Life in Radio and Voiceovers. And uh, I'm several months away from self publication. But if you check in periodically at neilross.com, uh, one of these days we'll see a thing on there that will tell you how to get the book. So. Look forward to that. Yeah. Well, I'm still I'm writing to you. I know you're you're still in. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and I'm taking naps. <laughs> well, you're 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 busy. You're very you're very busy with. I'm uh, doing layouts for DC for both the Deathstroke and uh, yes, uh, Michael Cray. Um, Deathstroke's been a, a surprise hit of mine. Oh, yeah. Certainly critically, everybody's been talking about it. I mean, you and Owsley are that, or I still call him Owsley. Priest. Christopher Priest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> still not out of the park. And you're still pretty busy with, uh, you do a lot with uh, basic voiceover rights. And yeah, I work with Screen Actors Guild, you know, yeah. fighting for the voiceover, fighting for the interactive actors to make sure they get paid, period. Yeah. And uh, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm working now in tandem, assisting uh, my daughter who has a, a new documentary called Love and Bananas, which will be a premier, world premiere in Washington, D.C., and then okay. New York, and then L.A. Gentlemen, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing these insights. A round of applause for these guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.